Because Iran pops up in the news frequently, and mostly when it pops up, it's often about censorship and surveillance. And our speaker here, Masa Ali Madani, she's actually an expert on this topic. She's a specialist. She currently works at the Oxford Internet Institute, where she researches politics of Iran and of the Iranian internet. But she also works for the NGO Article 19. And in, in her talk, which we hope we'll have to slide slides up very soon. <laughs> in her talk, she's doing a rundown of the current state of censorship and surveillance in Iran. So thank you for waiting until now. Please give a, give a warm round of applause to Masa Ali Madani. Well, thank you for coming and being so patient uh, to hear me talk today. Uh, I have to admit, I did not anticipate doing this without my computer in front of me, but I guess it's a good exercise in becoming less reliant on my devices. But I do still have my phone in my hand with the slides, so I think that will be useful. So the name of the talk is Tightening the Net, and so as um, the introduction went, I'm going to be talking a little bit about how information controls work on the Iranian internet. Um, you're probably listening to my voice, wondering why someone with an Iranian name sounds kind of American. Um, I'm I grew up in Canada, and I spent most of my life going back and forth between the various countries I lived in abroad and back to Iran. So that's why I sound this way. It's a Canadian accent. Um, and so I, I had slides to accompany what I was going to say next, and it had a frightening Iranian vampire that I was going to get into later on, but it seems that I can, you know, replace the frightening Iranian vampire for now. Um, so the reason why I am here, who am I? Um, well, I wear a lot of different hats. Uh, the introduction said that I am, oh, that's not my slide. There's a frightening woman in front of me. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, um, I'm doing my uh, PhD at the Oxford Internet Institute, and there I'm studying how social media evolves in Iran's information control space to see how uh, political participation shapes, especially during elections and things like that. Um, I also spend the majority of my time at a London-based NGO called Article 19, and there I work with a Iran team uh, that tracks uh, how freedom of expression and access to information takes shape in Iran. And ooh, I think my slides are on their way up here. No? Is it there? It will come. That's promising. Um, so, at uh, Article 19, oh. Yay, my slides are here. That's so exciting. Um, oh, can I actually, and then it goes. Can I actually control it? That's so exciting. Oh, I have to signal, okay. We can go to the next slide. Nope. Nope. Yes. Oh, this is fun. Okay, so this was the part that would appear when I'm explaining who I am. What are you? It's a scene from the movie that um, I've been referencing. It's called A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night. I think you should all watch it. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Uh, so um, there was a troll on Twitter yesterday when I posted about my talk who were saying that I'm kind of doing warmongering or something like that. So I just want to leave a disclaimer. Um, I do work on human rights. Uh, I am talking about some of the repressive things that happens in Iran, but this is not a, um, a talk to scare you away from Iran. In fact, um, if you can go back. Um, <laughs> in fact, um, if it if I weren't here and if I weren't doing this particular type of work, I would probably be 
in Iran with my family for the holidays. So I urge you, if you have no security concerns, please go. It's an amazing uh, country, lots to see. Um, but one thing you will find is that the internet experience is a little bit different than what you would experience here in Leipzig, which kind of brings me around to the topic of my talk. So the Iranian internet is sometimes known as filternet. Um, this is a term that a lot of us uh, who do kind of digital advocacy for Iran know and often use. I think the term was coined uh, uh, around uh, 2009 or 2010 by a Iranian uh, journalist who focuses on technology named Nima Akbarpour. You can follow the hashtag uh, on Twitter and you can see lots of different things related to internet censorship and surveillance in Iran. And so, next slide. Um, there's also uh, the series that I help run with a, a number of colleagues at Article 19, which is called Tightening the Net, the name of this talk. And if you want to get into the nitty gritty details of what happens in terms of internet policy, in terms of um, how users are put at risk in Iran, uh, this is a, a series you can follow. And it started initially with um, the National Internet Project, which is sort of um, sometimes known as the Halal Net. And then uh, we looked at soft war and cyber tactics in Iran for the next edition. And now every um, quarter we come out with a rundown of what's going on online in Iran with a series of advocacy recommendations for various branches of the Iranian government. So if you want to get more information beyond the generalities of this talk, do check that out. Next slide. Um, so, understanding the um, filter net. In order to understand, next slide. Um, so, whenever I do this, it means next slide. So, understanding um, what happens online, um, you have to kind of understand that in Iran there is um, an infrastructure of control that kind of uh, shapes how this works. And I can show this to you. Um, here, which is kind of a um, map of what's going on uh, in Iran. And you can see that in Iran, um, the head of state is in fact not elected. It's the supreme leader. Um, he's kind of a, a religious authority, but also he has ultimate veto power over everything that happens in the country. And you can see him up at the top. I'm not signaling to change, I'm just pointing. Um, it's, he's up at the top there, and everything sort of like falls under his umbrella. And um, what's interesting to know that every four years there, are, there is a democratic element to the government in Iran, and there is a president that gets elected. And within the president's cabinet, you have the Ministry of ICT, Information, Communications, and Technology. And within the Ministry of ICT, you see a lot of what happens in terms of control inside of Iran. So the Ministry of ICT runs the telecommunications company of Iran, and they maintain and authorize all the ISPs. And so in some ways, this has been really good because the current administration that was elected back in 2013 and it was re-elected in 2017 is a moderate administration and so it's done a lot to improve internet conditions in Iran. Um, internet speeds have um, uh, improved by huge amounts. So sometimes the Iranian internet was known as Kondnet, which kind of is like slow internet. But that's really improved since um, this government has come into power and it's the government of President Rouhani. And um, other things like internet access has come to uh, villages that often didn't have this kind of access. So um, in terms of ICT for development, there's been a lot of progress over the past few years because of the work of this government and that ministry. But in terms of how um, surveillance occurs, so all internet traffic is routed through the telecommunications company of Iran, including private and government ISPs. And the TCI, as you can see, uh, right below the Ministry of ICT, um, is responsible for blocking web pages and blacklisting keywords. And uh, in terms of surveillance, uh, the TCI also uses proxy servers for surveillance by logging all unencrypted web traffic, which is why it's really important for there to be HTTPS over websites in Iran. Um, 
What was particularly uh, concerning is that underneath the control of the Supreme Leader, there's a body called the Revolutionary Guards. And so every time there's a protest movement in Iran or there's any sort of opposition to the status quo, the Revolutionary Guards help the regime kind of um, uh, you know, quell protesters, arrest them, gather intelligence. And so the IRGC, um, excuse me, uh, in 2009, the IRGC, a consortium owned by this kind of paramilitary organization, bought about 51% of the telecommunications company of Iran because the government was trying to privatize it, but in essence, its ownership falls, uh, fell under this kind of repressive body within the establishment. So beyond um, strengthening the, the, the Revolutionary Guards with, you know, financial, through financial means, um, they had direct access to the data of ordinary citizens, which is uh, super concerning. We can go to the next slide now. Um, yeah, this was the news back in 2009 when they uh, got 51% of the shares of the telecommunications company of Iran. Next slide. Um, so, just to go over a brief history of controls, because uh, along with the infrastructure of control, there's kind of um, a legal mechanism for how this kind of established itself. So back in 2001, um, filtering really started in Iran because uh, there was a crackdown on newspapers and a lot of people started migrating online. Um, the script for writing Persian uh, on online was developing, so there was um, this huge migration and it was only around 2001 that the government started targeting and doing censorship of these, uh, you know, more reformist or progressive journalists and activists who were writing and kind of um, going against the ethos of the regime. You can go back. You went ahead too much. Is that, are you doing it? Oh, <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> totally did not make that connection. Um, so uh, that was in 2001, and they wanted to codify how this system works in terms of the filtering committee that um, enables this. And so in 2006, there was a draft law known as the Computer Crimes Law. And um, actually, Article 19, uh, the law team and the Iran team, I wasn't part of it because this was before my time at the organization, they actually are the only source of... Um, uh, translating and analyzing uh, this uh, law, and so it came into a draft form in 2006, and then by um, 2009, they really wanted to mobilize it and make sure it went into law, and 2009 um, was when the Green Movement happened, and so uh, the government was kind of trying to rein in control over what kind of discourse was going on online, because they, um, they effectively shut down the internet for a small period of time during that protest movement. And so right after this happened, they uh, picked, picked up speed on this and made sure it passed. And by 2010, this became law. Um, you can take a look at this document um, in more precise form. Um, uh, different things like Article 10, which makes things like encryption illegal, came out of this document. Different things like... Um, uh, the filtering committee that decides through multi uh, multi agency network of different ministries and different experts in the government what content needs to be filtered. Do you want me to do this? And you can. <laughs> Sorry, I feel bad. I'm, I've made you. Yeah. <laughs> Here she is. <laughs> Go ahead with this. Go back with okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, didn't, I didn't realize, and she was crouching here the entire time, and <laughs> that's not cool. Um, um, so, uh, so, the next thing I have is a video, which I feel like is going to get really difficult. Um, um, so, the law came into effect in 2010, um, and different bodies came into uh, formation as well. Um, things like the Revolutionary 
uh, guards set up their own cyber division known as Gerdab in 2009, right after the protest movement. Um, Iran's police forces uh, also um, established um, uh, their own poli uh, cyber force named Fatah in 2011. And because uh, the establishment was realizing that the internet was so basically crucial to the functioning of the nation, um, national security was being compromised, things like cyber attacks against the country's infrastructure was happening. Uh, the Supreme Leader basically wanted everything centralized to him, and so he created the Supreme Council of Cyberspace, which its name translated into English is very sci-fi and um, fun to say sometimes. And that happened in 2012. And um, so this is all kind of like boring and I guess lots of dates and lots of things, but it's really important to how things happen day to day in Iranians' lives and how they experience the internet. And so back in um, a few years ago, a colleague and I, um, Elke at the University of Amsterdam, decided to go through the censorship redirect page. So every time you want to uh, visit a page that censored, it's called paywanda.ir. You can probably look this up if you want. And so we, using the Wayback Machine, we like traced it over the years and how it evolved and how it kind of reflects on this changing internet policy. So I'm gonna take a crack at playing this. I'm probably gonna really mess this up actually. But um, so this is the video. Can I do it without? Yes. I can't, I can't, I can't yeah. Anything. Okay. Yeah. Obama arose with the establishment of Iran's cybercrime laws following the 2009 Green Movement. The different versions of Pevana.ir, which contain a literature related to these laws and regulations, evolve as norms of what constitutes as filtered content becomes more entrenched with Iran. From the inception of the very first version of the page, whereby users are told, in the name of God, according to the Computer Crimes Act, Access to this website requested is not possible. The message that users are viewing a censorship page is toned down in the next version, whereby users are only told that the links they are viewing are some of the registered links. Within version 2, we also see the pavana.ir website creating pages related to internet policy. The third version of pavana.ir continues with the theme of religious references, with a poem featured that states, if you listen to the words of the poet Saadi, he says he consents to require the consent of him. Immediately to the right of this, users see the text in the name of God and the merciful, as if to subtly tell users that the censorship they are experiencing is by the will of God. These religious references are continued in version four, whereby the main feature of the page is a changing image that makes references to national holidays and events, maintaining the theme of allusions to Shia Islam and national imams. This image, for instance, depicts a mosque marking the festival of Imam Reza, asking users to click on a link to submit ideas for the festival. Version 5 of Pevana.ir brings attention to the Islamic nature of censorship. The links featured here are perhaps the most related to state propaganda in comparisons to the other versions. While the previous version did not display any links, all previous versions of Pevana.ir featured the popular Persian language blogging platform Blogva. However, this version omits the website. The omission of the main image in version 5 makes it hard to establish a firm connection between the previous and following versions. This finding is in line with the notion that archives of web pages are not always successful in capturing all of the content. However, further research shows that this version still made use of images regarding Shia Islam. The After the Green Movement Internet Controls in Iran from 2009 until 2012 report by the OpenNet initiative has captured and saved the version of pevana.ir as it was on the 25th of October 2012. This image features Quranic writings. The last two iterations of the website in versions 6 and 7 are very similar in design. The sudden change in design was explained by an anonymous source to make filtering more pleasant, or rather to appear as a subtle part of the Iranian internet experience, rather than one presented with indoctrinating aspects of the government. The significant change that comes in version 7, however, is the prominent feature of the internet policy links. Concluding, we can say that this historiography of the pavana.ir website demonstrates a timeline of the beginning of the heightened internet controls from the inception of the page in 2010 to the present day. The changes in the page essentially demonstrate the evolution of the ways the Iranian state 
represents its censorship policies. The notions of religious motifs decrease over time, whereas the focus on internet policy becomes more present by the last iteration of the page. And that was that. Um, and as I struggle to go back to my presentation. Oh, I did it without any glitches. How exciting. Um, and so over the years, there have been different programs that the government has kind of put into place beyond the censorship uh, that they do. Um, things that I have been following through my own work have been the spider program, which comes from the Revolutionary Guards um, Gary Dob di Division, the cyber kind of uh, Iranian cyber division of the Revolutionary Guards and intelligent filtering, um, the National uh, Information Network and um, the different ways that uh, the Iranian government has been trying to attack journalists, activists, and human rights defenders. Um, in terms of that, the attacking uh, these kind of vulnerable individuals that pose a threat, um, there's a lot of different projects. Uh, Article 19 had an Iranian cyber army report about this, and there's been really great work to track this being done by the um, uh, campaign for Human Rights in Iran by their researcher Amir Rashidi and by two other researchers who've been tracking this with the Iran Threats Project, uh, Colin Anderson and Claudio Granieri. Um, so there's tons of great research being done in terms of identifying um, these attackers. Um, the intelligent filtering uh, project that the Iranian government has been doing is something that I looked into with um, another colleague, Frederick Jacobs, in 2015. And basically, at that time, we were noticing that the Iranian government was making these really grand um, statements. That's the Ministry of ICT. Um, about how they had a sophisticated means to censor individual pages on different social media. And basically, this has been a old policy that they've wanted to do. So uh, sites like Facebook and Twitter were uh, censored after the protest movement in 2009. Actually, in the lead up to the protest movement, they were censored. And so for a long time, uh, various members of the government have said they want to unblock these platforms and find a means to just censor individual pages or problematic content and leave these websites open. However, that's really hard to do unless the government has a relationship with these companies, if they have a relationship with Facebook or Twitter. And so uh, back in 2015, they made a grand announcement that they had finally nailed it and they were doing this on Instagram. And Instagram is one of the more popular social media platforms. And so what we noticed was that the censorship, intelligent censorship, which is just individual pages um, or individual pictures or accounts being censored, it was only being done on the mobile app. And the reason was that Instagram hadn't um, yet rolled out HTTPS on the mobile application. It had uh, enabled it on the, br the browser version of the website. And so the Iranian government's <laughs> great grand unveiling of intelligent censorship was in reality um, just uh, Instagram not doing this. And so um, we found what kind of content they were targeting, which was really interesting kind of uh, cultural research in terms of how censorship was working. And then um, uh, my colleague got in touch with Instagram and they soon rolled out the HTTPS on the mobile app and then uh, intelligent censorship came unraveling as the motherboard uh, writer Lorenzo wrote, Iran's smart Instagram censorship isn't that smart. And so that's just one example of these grand policies that actually don't really um, add up to very much. Um, in terms of intelligent filtering, uh, the researcher Colin Anderson recently found um, this database of URLs that different ISPs were giving uh, to this um, company called Sahab Pardaz. I can't talk too much about this, but this was kind of a public notice he put out to ask anyone interested in this data set to see if this is actually another phase of intelligent filtering. However, the minister of ICT um, did respond to this and said that they are not actually compromising users' data, and he condemned the work of this um, company, Sahab Pardaz, which doesn't quite add up, which I guess helps illustrate how confusing um, internet policy is in Iran. Like, what are they actually doing? What are they, what are they actually saying? Um, how does it align with the laws and those kinds of regulations? In 2016, um, through the budget 
it was announced that Iran was spending about 66 million on the intelligent filtering project. However, it's really unclear what that adds up to, like what are the deliverables on this work that they're doing. So um, again, it's kind of like this chaotic quagmire of what's actually happening or not. In terms of um, their ability to silence different voices in Iran, uh, they have been kind of um, uh, targeting different users in different ways. In 2015-2016, um, in 2016, uh, the Gerdab spider program uh, was round, rounding up series of models and people in the fashion industry in Iran that are quite prominently present on Instagram. And while some of the statements coming from Gerdab was saying that they had technical hacking abilities, what they were actually doing was arresting these models and you know, uh, forcing passwords and getting their accounts that way. Um, but during that time, I actually got an Instagram request from one of these seized accounts, um, Nika uh, Clothing, which you can see over there. And you can see that Gerdab had taken it over because there's a notice that's saying, because of such and such law, this um, account has been seized under the SPIDER program. And so that was happening for a while under this. Again, um, more actual physical takeover than technical sophistication of that kind of work. Another thing that's quite concerning that um, the Campaign for Human Rights actually was the first to report on was um, the Supreme Council of Cyberspace requiring all Telegram accounts to register with the government. And so um, Telegram is uh, hugely popular inside of Iran. It's almost ubiquitous and it's often used as a social media application. And so the public channels are run by administrators and if you have more than 5,000 followers, they basically needed you to register and get approval. And by registering, they would add a bot to the account and the bot could basically get um, information of the administrators and the followers, which was quite dangerous because last May when um, in the lead up to the presidential elections, there was a roundup of telegram administrators that a lot of digital activists believe was through this registration program of having all of this personal data. Um, excuse me. In terms of the National um, Internet Project, um, it's quite a contentious project in that a lot of people say that on one extreme, it goes towards being like uh, North Korea's intranet, kind of closed off from the rest of the world. Um, I, through my own work, I don't think this is what the Iranian government wants to do. Um, they do want to um, localize certain things like banking and different forms of infrastructure against um, cyber attacks like Stuxnet. But um, in general, what they want to do is keep data inside of the country so they can have access and control. And part of this project has been to create imitation versions of foreign companies. So like I said, they couldn't um, force Facebook or Twitter to censor things for them because they don't have a relationship. But if they have local versions, they can effectively do this. And so they've come up with alternatives for things like Instagram with Lenzor, which you can see has a very oddly similar uh, user interface. Um, but uh, oftentimes users inside of Iran don't trust these imitation apps, so um, usage amongst for like Instagram is always much higher than it is for the local alternatives. Um, one researcher a few years ago saw um, that the way that a Telegram uh, imitation app was implemented, kind of traced how the data was going back to the government. So there's generally a sense of distrust for this kind of work. Um, throughout the year, since 2016, this attempt to localize user content has really increased. They put an ultimatum on uh, platforms that have not been censored yet, like Telegram and Instagram, that they had a year to bring their servers inside of the country or else it would be censored. This obviously didn't work. Um, so in uh, 2017, uh, this past year, they've been doing different things that kind of have basically added up to um, 
uh, net discrimination. Like they've been going against net neutrality values by offering incentives for people to uh, use local traffic, um, access local traffic, local uh, platforms and websites uh, over international ones. And they've been giving million dollar incentives to developers to create apps. And for example, if they got a million users, they would get a million American dollars for developing such a um, such a um, platform, uh, recently we just translated and analyzed a new um, policy that's uh, forming into a law by the Supreme Council of Cyberspace Policy and Action on organizing social media messaging applications, and this is just a set of rules for local apps and foreign apps that need to follow in order to operate inside of Iran. Um, this supposed to be a GIF, but that didn't work. Um, so uh, another point that's kind of come up uh, over, especially over the past year, is how controls don't only come from the Iranian government, but they also come from abroad. So um, companies like Apple and um, Google, in order to comply and sometimes over comply with US sanctions. They've been denying certain services to Iranians. So uh, what has been happening it has been uh, Iranian app developers have been seeing their apps being rejected from the Google Play Store and the Apple, the App Store, um, <coughs> mainly because they were providing um, financial transactions over it. And even things that weren't directly doing financial payments were getting blocked, such as um, one particular app, which is kind of the Uber of Iran called Snap, uh, they were told to remove financial payments over the app or else they would get removed from the app store. Once they did remove that, it seemed that they knew that there was some sort of financial transaction occurring offline and they still removed that app from the app store just to comply with sanctions. Um, there's also a kind of threat to other companies as um, the nuclear negotiations went through back in 2015. There's a lot of foreign companies going in. There's been a huge um, influx of tele the telecom sector like Vodafone and Orange and uh, different companies like that going to Iran. And there's kind of a fear that social media giants like Twitter and Facebook might find incentive to also go. So it's always good to keep pressure to, um, for them to remain transparent about their dealings with Iran. Um, the new minister of ICT recently said that he had um, started negotiations with Twitter to unfilter Twitter in Iran. However, um, Twitter has refused to officially reply or say anything. So the thing that I spend most of my time working on um, in terms of social media discourse is Telegram, because Telegram is kind of an exciting new territory in understanding social media, especially in Iran, because internet penetration and Telegram usage are almost on par. So there's about 40 to 45 million internet users inside of Iran. And according to the company Telegram, there's about 25 million daily users and about 40 million monthly users. So what this means for how people communicate, how people are accessing information in Iran is huge because oftentimes everything from shopping to staying in touch with friends to getting updates on the weather and traffic and news, it comes from Telegram and the public channels. So um, understanding this and how, how the government is responding to such an important application for communication is also really important and as always it's become sort of a target uh, for vulnerable at-risk users. For example, a number of journalists a few years ago were having their, um, their accounts seized through um, SMS um, uh, brute force entry, I mean, through SMS logins they were able to get in. And so there's those kinds of um, concerns. Telegram has been kind of reactive to these security flaws. Um, when the journalists had their accounts taken over through the SMS hacks, they did help re reinstate them. A few weeks ago, there was a flaw in um, a notification um, that users got in Iran 
on Telegram that hackers were able to sort of take over. You can see in that picture over there. And Telegram kind of reacted really fast and fixed the flaw. But um, the issue that uh, a lot of digital rights activists on Iran find is that Telegram is so important and it's so crucial to how a lot of um, things operate inside of Iran, yet they're not really trying to prevent anything. They're being much more reactive. So, um, yeah, there's also been concerns about how they um, interact with the Iranian government as well. And um, however, Telegram has kind of always made a, uh, t t taken a stand to say that they are not cooperating with um, the Iranian government. And, um, but uh, they, they do say large things, boastful things that they stand for freedom of speech, yet they have um, failed to really reach out to civil society and human rights activists for Iran. And so um, there's a general kind of plea towards uh, this platform that's so important for them to be a bit more cooperative and, uh, and prioritize um, these human rights concerns in Iran a little bit more. Um, I was going to slightly get into um, more security aspects of things, but I'll quickly go over it. Um, so obviously there's security concerns with Telegram. Um, it takes up some of the work that I do at Article 19, working with civil society and protecting them in that way. Um, so I'll just quickly go over it because I wanted to end on a particular note. So this is like a very... Um, <laughs> A standard thing I'd like to say is you don't necessarily apply the same security um, concerns to Iran that you would here. So just these grand statements of you signal, you tour often don't work. Um, Telegram is hugely popular, so I often say, why don't we work on making Telegram safer? Because users are not going to migrate away from it unless Signal comes and creates a whole like infrastructure and platform that's going to cater to those specific needs of being both social media and having the different usability features. So that's th really the last point I wanted to take away with. Um, but I also just wanted to have one kind of message, which is I am super privileged to be standing here and talking about this topic that I, uh, I'm really passionate about. And I am <laughs> really grateful that I've had this opportunity since over the years to work on um, these kind of digital rights concerns on Iran. And um, I've had certain personal hurdles in terms of, um, without getting into the nitty gritty of my personal life and the things I've had to go through, but there's been this general um, kind of mood in the past year with the Me Too movement and all these different stories of harassment. And um, basically, uh, I've been really grateful to all the people who have supported me over the years to make sure that the hurdles I've had to encounter for the specific kind of unfortunate personal events that took place that have affected my career um, to really help support me. And when I was coming to Leipzig, I was super proud to be coming to the Chaos uh, Computer Club's events. and. The stories I've been hearing about people who have been victims of harassment have really um, upset me. And um, I think it would be, I would be remiss to not make a point of saying that I'm a little bit disappointed that um, I, I, I've been reading these things. And And um, while I really appreciate all of you and all the help you gave me to set up my talk, and uh, I appreciate that I've been given this platform, but I really hope we can do better because this is just not cool. Um, it's not cool for people to not feel safe, and I know how it feels personally. And um, uh, I, I hope Dina, I haven't seen her yet. I have chatted with her briefly. I hope she's having a great time at this Congress because um, and I'm really sorry to hear that some of some people that I think are doing great work and should be in the space are not here this year. 
and I just hope we can do better in 2018. And that's about it. Thank you. Thanks for your talk, Masa Ali Madani, and uh, for your patience with our technical problems. Thank you very much. <laughs> Please line up at the microphones. There are four microphones here in the room. Please line up there. We have um, a couple more minutes for Q&A. You want to hold a Q&A? Yes. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but first, maybe there are the signal angels in the back. Is he waving or not? Are there any questions from the internet? No, nothing. OK, thank you. There is someone standing at microphone three. What's your question? Hi, thanks for your last statement, really. Thanks a lot here. Um, my question would be about Instagram and Telegram. I, I don't know if I missed that part, but does it mean that then the Iranian government has relationships with them? Because y you mentioned that they help, I mean, they show these things, so you've been blocked, and this is because of this. So why this, why this happens, and why? Is it only these two particular platforms? Like, I understood that Twitter and Facebook don't cooperate. If you could say more about that, thanks. Yeah, that's a really great question and um, something that's been really interesting. So I think I mentioned that this new government, the moderate Rouhani administration, has kind of, at least in terms of how it's positioned, the words it says, um, has been a bit more open to internet freedoms and things like that. And so I think one of the achievements of that government is stopping the censorship of Instagram and Telegram, because there's lots of hardline elements in the establishment that have wanted this to get censored, and it's kind of like come to deliberation to censor it over the years. There have been some rumors that Telegram has been working with um, uh, with the Iranian government, although um, I think that might be rumors because the Ministry of ICT every so often says that they have a direct relationship and then Telegram comes and refutes it. So um, yeah, that's up in the realm of rumors, however, but I think it's mainly the work of this moderate uh, administration that's been able to prevent the censorship. If that answers your question. So they are in connection with Instagram? Um, no, they're, uh, as far as I know, they're not working with Instagram. Instagram is owned by Facebook, so Facebook is censored. But, um, I mean, there could be many different reasons, but these are all conjecture. Um, Instagram is just kind of more for entertainment, so they have less of a reason to block it. Um, but also uh, the work of this uh, moderate administration to kind of keep Instagram going. Although for a short while during the elections, they were blocking Instagram live because it was being used for like protests and gatherings and things like that. Yeah. Um, microphone number one, please. Masa, just wanted to thank you for, for your talk and also peering, persevering through all the adversity, not only of nation state actors, but of also people inside the community that Come might. A little not bit closer to the microphone, please. Sure. I just wanted to say thank you for persevering through all the adversity that has come your way and for being here today to give this talk. It's important and vital, and your voice is valued. I have a question about Iran in a geopolitical landscape as it's exerting itself more in Yemen, Lebanon, perhaps other places. Do you see that the technology that's being pioneered by the state apparatuses, the state bodies inside of, inside of Tehran and in Iran will have a, a trickle-down effect um, into other countries that may replicate the oppressive structures in which that Iran has, has placed? Do you see it being a model um, as Iran geopolitically exerts its muscle? Will, do you see that some of these, the, the, the technical sophistication and other things will um, be picked up by other actors in the region? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, um, I think Iran would like to have the technical sophistication that would be replicated elsewhere. And I guess in some ways, um, uh, the capabilities within the Iran cyber, Iran cyber army, which is kind of very hard to associate directly with the government because sometimes the affiliations are very loose. Um, they have certain capabilities, but in terms of like the technology, I think, for censorship and surveillance, I think Iran more models itself on the technology coming out of China and Russia because they have had more effective and more sophisticated platforms and means of doing it. So I think it's a little bit the other way around. 
Microphone number one, please. Uh, thank you for your talk. You, if I'm not wrong, you mentioned uh, some government supporters being arrested. Um, is this correct? Uh, do you see any kind of clash between the Revolutionary Guard or the religious power and the government? The government? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, after the nuclear negotiations, the foreign minister, Javad Zarif, who is like kind of a little bit westernized, he speaks perfect English, and um, he, had, he has a huge fan base in Iran because he established the nuclear deal. He had like almost physical confrontations in parliament with the hardline elements, so... Um, yeah, there definitely is that, and the reason why um, some of the Telegram administrators who are actually supporters of Rouhani were arrested is because of this kind of clash between ele hardline elements like the Revolutionary Guards and the more moderate administration. So there is this kind of, yeah, differentiation and nuance that happens. I guess we're moving to the last question at microphone number three, please. Oh, hey. I, I just want to ask a question. Um, what can we... First of all, thank you for your great talk. It's very well researched and great information and for your very brave proclamation. Um, what can we in, in the room do other than fund your work? Can we put pressure on the companies uh, that you know, work inside of Iran? Can we put pressure on the governments of the nations we're citizens in? Like, what's the next step for people who are listening and want to do something? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, especially if you're not American, I think the Iranian government would be more open to hearing kind of the non-Western perspective. But I think, like, the reason why I think it's so important to be here in Europe is because Europe is actively engaging in dialogue with Iran. So if there's a way to put pressure through the different companies that are going into Iran, like, um, like I mentioned, there's, you know, the British Vodafone and, like, Fr France's Orange that are going in, if they can make certain demands for, you know, human rights um, uh, standards and things like that, that would be... That would also be really great. I mean, campaigning and putting pressure different ways through social media is always helpful. Um, the, the main thing that I think we could uh, perhaps have effect on is hopefully uh, a company like Telegram is listening and they can make uh, the security and privacy of Iranians one of, them, one of their bigger priorities. So that's really the place that I think can have um, the most uh, change because we can have more, um, we can have easier dialogue with like Facebook, Telegram, and all these different platforms to ensure that privacy and security is upheld. Awesome, Ali Madani, thank you very much for the talk. And please give her a warm round of applause. <laughs>